Welcome to another episode of me reviewing highlights. Like always, I include uh, chapter markers for different highlights throughout this video. So you can uh, feel free to jump uh, directly to the highlight that you want. And I also include links to the various books that I talk about. So with that, let's get started with our highlights uh, for today. Let's get started with uh, the first one from Clear Thinking. That little voice in your head may whisper its doubts, but it will also remind you of the many hardships and challenges you have overcome in the past and the fact that you persevered. No matter who you are, you have given that little voice many positive moments to speak of. Right, so this book is about uh, thinking clearly. Uh, like, you know, well, thinking is our biggest asset and uh, it uh, it is worth investing time into it, you know, how we think, how we um, uh, employ systems for example you know systems thinking and uh, well this passage is unrelated to all of that so i won't digress too much uh, this is talking about you know the little voice you know I, I think all of us know this little voice in our head that will always whisper its doubts will always kind of stop you when you're trying to do something and everything so it's always helpful to remind that uh, remind that voice that um like the author says, you know, I'll just repeat that. Uh, no matter who you are, you've given that little voice many positive moments to speak of. So it should rather talk about that uh, rather than the hardships and challenges that uh, or, or the doubts, really. Let's move on to Bittersweet. One could view it as a burden, be crushed by it. He continues, looking away from me at the rain outside the window. But it's a matter of choosing your attitude to the legacy you're given. There has to be a reason, a meaning for why we survived and the others didn't. This, of course, is the heart of meaning-centered psychotherapy or meaning-centered anything. The death sentence has come. It was always here from the moment we were born. And what do you live for then? So I can't really place the context, uh, you know, where this uh, where this passage comes. And I think without the context, it's still a very... Um, I'll use the word beautiful. It's it's still a very beautiful message. Um, you know, the choosing your attitude to the legacy you're given. There has to be a reason, a meaning for why we survived and the others didn't. But really talk about it, I think I need the context and I'm forgetting that. So I'll move on. The big leap. The gifted child is often convinced uh, is often convicted of stealing attention from other members of the family. One unconscious uh, solution gifted one unconscious solution gifted children device okay yeah okay so one unconscious solution gifted children device is to turn down the volume on their genius so the other others don't feel threatened by it the other solution is to continue to shine brightly but turn on the volume of their enjoyment of it if they if they can appear to be suffering they can get empathy and sympathy from others instead of jealousy so this book is about uh, the zone of genius uh, and like the name is big leap it's it's about jumping from your zone of uh, excellence to zone of genius and zone of excellence while great it's still where you're operating within your comfort zone and uh, the author is making a point uh, throughout the book is here as well but throughout the book that genius is not comfortable and uh, the author is talking about this uh, uh, this behavior that uh, or, or this uh, effect that seen that uh, a, a a child who is gifted would would do you know one of these two things they would either uh, pretend to be not a genius or you know pretend that they're not that gifted or they would uh, they would pretend to be that but they would they would uh, show that they're suffering that they're not really enjoying it it's, it's who they are but and they're suffering for it and they can't help it and um, yeah like the author says if they can appear to be suffering they can get empathy and sympathy from others instead of jealousy it, it's kind of like a survival mechanism because they know that they're going to face jealousy at all friends and uh, so i'm not sure how much i you know i agree with this i i do think that there are children who behave this way uh, in this in this manner but uh, I, I i don't know if i'm ready to make a blanket statement yet and um, that is why this is interesting to me um, you know moving on Pirates in the Navy. They had the resources and foresight to develop innovative new technologies. What they seemed unwilling or unable to do was to implement the right business models to take those technologies into the market. This is the challenge we'll be facing as Pirates in the Navy. 
So throughout this book, the author makes this case that innovation, of course, it should exist. Research and development should exist, but there should also be a strong business model behind it. Uh, sometimes the author says that sometimes that these departments exist and um, they don't care too much about business models, you know, as in, you know, whatever they are working on, how will it really go and, and help the, the core business? I don't know, again, if I agree with this too much, because um, a lot of what I look at nowadays is uh, a complete outcome focused, business outcome focused uh, activity. So it's, it's valid, I think, uh, you, you know, the thoughts are still valid. I, I just don't see this everywhere. And uh, yeah, uh, I think really like that. I don't really have any more comments on this. I just don't see it everywhere. Uh, but yeah, I, I think, you know, like the places where I do see this happen, it's it's like it's, it's very difficult for the innovators, you know, or, or the creative geniuses to kind of um, link whatever they're working on, you know, and, and they would see it as art uh, and, and it'll be, uh, it'll be very painful for them to link it to a business model. So yeah, that's that. Moving on, getting things done. If you neglect this categorization, allow things of different meanings into the same visual or mental grouping, you will tend to go psychologically numb to the contents. If you put reference materials in the same pile as things you still want to read, for example, you'll go unconscious to the stack. If you put items on your next actions list that really need to go on the calendar because they have to occur on specific days, then you won't trust your calendar and you'll continually have to reassess your action list. If you have projects that you're not going to be doing anything about for some time, they must go on your someday maybe list so you can relate to the projects list with the rigorous action generating focus it needs. So the author, the categorization that the author mentions in the beginning, it's, it's about the it's about categorizing your next activity. All basically, there is a whole framework in the book. I, I think there were like some seven buckets. Uh, so whatever you're dealing with uh, on your desk, in your life, you know, the, the activities that you're going to take up, your events, your tasks, everything. They go into one of these seven buckets. So this categorization is important. And the author is giving multiple examples over here to show that, you know, what would happen if, if this category gets mixed up. So I won't repeat all of these things. You know, I, I think the um, the examples are quite clear to the point. So yeah, um, I, I do resonate with this. Many a times, you know, if I if I'm not maintaining, if I've kind of like uh, delayed on maintaining my um, uh, my action list, and uh, then like, the priorities have changed, and I've still not moved something from my current list to the someday list, I lose the list becomes less reliable. So I, I do resonate with this. Let's move on. Hidden potential. I've, I've accepted that life is like diving. If you're ever lucky enough to get a 10, it's not for perfection, but for excellence. I, I really like this. The author is uh, uh, recounting a story of their own diving experiences and um, how, the, how they uh, became attracted to diving and everything. They got a coach who uh, focused on constant improvement rather than perfect dives, uh, they celebrated improvement. And, and like that's the, that's what this whole section is about in the improvement and the excellence and improvement. It's not about perfection. Excellence is not about perfection. It's a very common, um, uh, uh, it's a very common uh, confusion. You know, I'm forgetting the right word for that. But um, yeah, so this is a closing to that section that life is like diving. If you're ever lucky enough to get a 10, it's not for perfection, but for excellence. So yeah, I, I really enjoyed this section. And this is, it's a new book. I'm still reading it. I, I, I think about um, halfway through it so far. And uh, Adam Grant, like all of his books, you know, I think like he's again, uh, given like a very, very, um, um, very systematic representation of uh, you know the subject hidden potential or let, let, let's even forget the word hidden put uh, hidden in the potential you know a lot of potential is always hidden so moving on get it done asking yourself in the third person why you feel something and how you plan to deal with it helps suppress negative emotions because it feels somehow as if it's happening to somebody someone else okay um I don't really know what to comment on this. I think it's pretty clear. 
I'll move on. Hidden potential again. Whenever performance stagnates before it improves again, it declines. When people's skills stalled in tasks ranging from Tetris to golf to memorizing facts, they didn't usually ascend again until after they had deteriorated. We see this in many things, you know, whenever we are at the cusp of um, significant growth, our performance will drop down. Um, and, and like, you know, I, I can't even remember how many times I've seen this uh, in myself, in other people as well, that um, you, you would feel that, uh, you know, for example, if you're seeing this in other people, you would feel that they have lost interest in something or, uh, you know, it was like beginner's luck and now they've lost, um, lost that that magic and suddenly you'll see that okay oh there is a sudden improvement and you know the magic is back and it's it, it was it's better than it was ever before uh, uh, and uh, it turns out that it's it's a studied phenomenon <laughs> you know uh, so a lot like you know i mean like everything in uh, the, uh, this book it is well studied uh, the, the, it, it's well researched there are studies backing this so uh, it doesn't make it a truth i understand that but uh, yeah, still, th th there is enough evidence to show that uh, this happens very often, that uh, um, for anything, for, for any kind of performance, to, uh, for it to get better, it, it declines in the beginning. And the author goes on to explain why. I'll just give a summary of why this happens. You know, the book is still the best resource for this. It, it happens because um, any kind of shift that you need to do, it's going to feel a little uncomfortable. We are, uh, you, you know, like as, as we keep practicing, we get used to a particular way of working and that's where our performance comes through. I'm, I'm reminded of this whole, uh, you know, the concept in the big leap also, you know, we, we reviewed that passage a little earlier. So uh, the author in that also makes a case that, you know, jumping from one zone to another takes a lot of effort. So it's something like that, that, uh, you know, when, you're, when your performance is going to improve drastically, it's essentially because you have jumped a zone, you are, you are looking at it from a different point of view. Either you have changed the practice significantly or you have changed your mindset around uh, or perception or mindset mindset around it uh, significantly. So as you give up your, uh, what you have practiced so far, you know, something that you're comfortable with, your performance will go down because you know, what, what was working for you all this time, you're not doing that anymore. So of course it goes down. And then, then there is that moment when it clicks that, yeah, uh, you, you know, okay, you, you've got that new method all set up and uh, your performance suddenly jumps up again. So, yeah, uh, I, I think that's about it. Let's move on. Wrong fit, right fit. Who a company says they are really matches how the company works day to day. That's not to say the ways of working are bad or misguided or nefarious. No, they're simply different from what is expressed through formal communication challenges. Expertly crafted mission or vision or value statements, breath breathtaking career sites and employer uh, brand campaigns and inspiring leadership town halls. A 2020 study by MIT and Culture 500 found zero correlation between the cultural values a company publishes and how well the company lived up to those values in the eyes of their employees. So the author is making, a, it's a long passage, uh, but the author is essentially making a point that, you know, what's advertised is not what you get. I, 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 you know, I think that's like not a big takeaway. Everybody, all of us realize that. So uh, when we are looking at a company and you know the their websites their values and everything that you see it's essentially put forward through a marketing team it's filtered it's made sure that it looks good it, it, it it's probably undergone focus group studies and everything and you can't go wrong with that you know it, it, it is very attractive that's their job to make it attractive but the day-to-day -day work improving that takes a lot more effort right so uh, that's why there is like the author says zero correlation uh, one of the things I ask, you know, I, I, randomly in my organization, I meet people uh, just as when they have come in. In fact, I met with someone this week and uh, I commonly ask them, you know, you have just joined and uh, you saw all of, uh, you saw my organization from outside all of this time. And uh, now that you're here for a couple of weeks, what do you feel? And I get that a couple of weeks is too soon, but still it's a, it's a valid question to ask. Uh, what do you feel? And I'm always happy that they felt that, okay, the alignment was there. Um, so as good as our marketing department is, it's, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that the rest of the teams are also catching up. Uh, as in they are, um, 
anyway, I think I'm digressing too much into this uh, to this area. But yeah, that's that's the mess essence of this uh, message that uh, uh, when you're looking at a company, be careful. And again, it may not be nefarious. That's the point the author makes. It's not intentional. Nobody's trying to mislead you. It is just the nature of the thing. Uh, let's move on. Hidden potential. When you're invested in a goal, being doubted by experts is a threat. They may be credible, but since they don't recognize your potential, they're not coaches who will help you improve. Their disbelief quickly becomes your insecurity. It shatters your confidence and stifles your growth. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But the research suggests that when they come from an uninformed audience, low expectations can become a self-negating prophecy. You're motivated to shatter their confidence that you won't succeed. Samir calls it the underdog effect. Uh, I think this is pretty clear. Um, I, I don't really know what to add on, add on this. If there is something that I can elaborate on, I can do that. Um, so, I, I doubt if anybody thinks of this uh, deliberately that, uh, okay, well, it's an expert who is doubting me, so... Um, I, I I may not be really I may really not be that good. Uh, it's instinctive, you know. We don't we don't have to deliberately think. Okay, who is doubting us to decide uh, or, or to react? Essentially, uh, there's no opportunity for decision. It's it's more of a reaction. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is an this is a good explanation for that. Uh, you know, like based on who is doubting you, how you would react uh, but the author is making an additional point here in this there is only a hint in this passage but it goes on that even if an expert is somebody who's uh, doubting you it doesn't mean that everything's lost it doesn't mean that uh, um, you don't have that potential or you don't have that gift it, it doesn't mean that it means that you probably need a scaffold and uh, that expert may not be the right person because uh, I, again you know i feel i'm digressing too much here uh, but essentially, they, they, they don't have the same experiences as you. They don't have the same shared experience or shared uh, strengths or shared weaknesses. So uh, they may not be a good coach. They may be an expert in their own right. True. Uh, that's completely valid. But uh, that may, that does not make them a good coach. Uh, again, something I really believe in. Uh, you know, uh, in, in myself, I found that it's very hard for me to teach something. Um, whereas I can talk about uh, various topics at different levels of... Um, uh, you know, at different levels of, um, I'm, I'm losing words right now. Yeah. So as you can see from this YouTube videos and many other YouTube videos, you know, I, I don't have a problem speaking up, but, um, as a teacher, I, I find a lot of trouble. So I do resonate with this finding. And I think that's it. We are at the end and this is one of the longer highlights. Uh, sorry, longer videos. Uh, we had a lot of uh, long passages and in many of them, I think we had a lot of uh, in-depth discussion as well. So it was all uh, fun. I think, uh, you know, um, it, it was a good discussion today. I think, you know, with the exception of like one or two where I couldn't remember anything. Uh, with that, I'll call it a good day. Have a good weekend, everyone.